Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Faith Family Church of God's Sunday night service. We're so glad to have you with us this evening. If you haven't already done so, please like and comment to let us know that you're here. Of course, feel free to always comment uh, yes and amen and comment, you know, anything um, that you feel like God is leading you to say during our sermon and our service tonight. Um, also, make sure to share this on your page so that uh, others who are on your friends list and in on your Facebook can see it as well. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel and like our video and click that bell notification so that you will get all of our notifications when we uh, post a video and go live in the future. But so before we go into our sermon tonight, let's have a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We bless your name, God. We thank you for all the blessings, God, that you've bestowed upon us, Lord God. So far, we thank you, God, for time together tonight, Lord God, as a body, Lord God, and studying in your word. Lord, you know the needs of each and every person present here tonight, Lord God. We just ask that you touch those who are sick in body, Lord God, whether it's from cancer or from the COVID-19 uh, coronavirus or from the common cold or whatever they're sick with, God. We trust and believe, Lord God, for healing in Jesus' name. Lord, those who are um, having troubles, Lord God, in their homes, their marriages, Lord God, their families, or finances, God, meet each and every need according to your will and for your glory, Lord God. Those who have lost loved ones in sin, Lord God, Lord, just be with them, Lord God, and draw our lost loved ones back to you, Lord God. You know each and every need, God. There are more needs, God, that I can't even mention, God, because they'd be too many to mention, Lord God. But we just trust you for each and every need, God, and we just ask that you would meet those needs according to your will and for your glory. And bless and anoint me as your messenger tonight, God, that we, I can bring the word that you have for your people. Open our hearts and our minds and our ears to receive your word, Lord God. Just, you, just have your way, Lord God, and speak to us, Lord God, through this message tonight. Draw us closer to you, Lord God, and we ask all these things in Jesus' mighty, holy, and precious name. And everybody says, Amen. All right, so tonight we're going to be talking about facing your trials. Sister Brenda and I were talking the other night. We just felt like God was leading us to go through a short mini-series that's focusing on the book of James. So a little bit of background about the book of James. It's believed that James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote this book as he became the leader of the Jerusalem church. The book of James itself has a lot of golden nuggets that we can take from the text. The book itself is kind of a how-to book, if you would, on how to live the Christian life. But tonight, we are going to be talking about the trials that we face. We all face trials in life each and every day. How we face those trials shapes us and defines us. So starting with verse 1 and going forward, Verse 1 is, of course, James greeting the 12 tribes scattered abroad, meaning the Christians who were living outside of Palestine. But going right into the text, verses 2 and 3, we're going to break it down verse by verse and discuss what these verses talk to us about. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So right off the bat, <laughs> you're thinking, whoa, you know, I'm supposed to be happy when I face something hard or horrible. Why would I be happy when something bad happens to me? That's what a lot of people think. But see, trials, conflicts, suffering, whatever you want to call them, are something that we all encounter. Every single person will go through life and experience some kind of trial on a daily basis. It's inevitable because the devil is trying to destroy us as God's creation. No, trials are not pleasant to go through, and they may cause us a lot of grief and heartache sometimes, but we as Christians, as followers of Christ, who are supposed to believe that God is with us everywhere we go and he is for us, we're supposed to consider trials as opportunities for rejoicing. And the reason why we're supposed to consider them as opportunities for rejoicing is because if we allow God to work in us through those trials, 
then those trials can be used as a tool that refines us, purifies us, and strengthens our faith, which in turn also produces patience and endurance. Again, we must count the trials that we face as an opportunity for clinging to God, drawing closer to Him, and strengthening our faith because it is essential to our maturity as a Christian. Even Abraham's faith had to be tested. Remember when God spoke to Abraham and told him to go and offer his son Isaac up as a burnt offering before God back in Genesis? That was a test of faith to see if Abraham would be obedient to God. And as Abraham was getting ready to strike and to kill Isaac, his own son, on the altar that he had prepared, God stopped Abraham and then provided a ram to be sacrificed instead. Now, God is not going to ask you to sacrifice your children or anything like that because Jesus is our ultimate blood sacrifice. But God will use the trials that the devil throws our way to test our faith and see if we will come to him for help. And through our trials, we can strengthen our patience as well. The meaning of patience here being that of bearing affliction. It also goes beyond that of bearing affliction as well. It also includes the idea of standing firm under pressure with a staying power that says we are determined to turn our trials into opportunities of growth. Verse 4 tells us, But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In other words, don't give up in the middle of your trial, and don't give in to the temptation to lash out against others in the middle of your trial, as so often we are tempted to lash out with our emotions when we are put under a lot of pressure from our trials. If we endure a trial to its end, if we cling to God and allow Him to strengthen us in our faith, patience and in our endurance, then we will have received everything that God intended us to receive by us going through that trial that we just faced. Whereas if we were to give up in the middle of our trial, or if we were to lash out in our emotions, we would not grow closer to God, we would not grow in our patience, we would not grow in our endurance, and we might even pull further away from God if we're not too careful. So we must be careful when we go into trials, not to act harshly or rashly. Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. The wisdom that God gives is not necessarily information on how to get out of trouble, but rather insight on how to learn from one's difficulties, how to make the best of it, in other words. It's not more information on how to avoid the times of testing, because we must all go through a testing period, but rather the wisdom he will give us is a new outlook or a new perspective on the situations that we find ourselves in. But the wisdom of God also begins with us having a genuine reverence or respect for God and a steadfast confidence and faith that God controls all circumstances because he does, in fact, guiding them to his good purposes. As Romans 8 and 28 says, we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And the beauty of all of this is all we have to do. You may say, well, Brother Andrew, that just sounds like a whole lot to do and you know, a whole lot to take in. You know, it's, it's a lot of effort. All you have to do is ask God for the wisdom and the help, and he will give it to us. You know, it does require some effort, but what in life does not require effort, you know? So all we have to do is ask God for the wisdom and the help, and he will give it to us. We just have to ask and constantly seek him and seek to stay in his presence and seek his help. Verses 6 through 8 says, But let him ask in faith, not doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. 
Doubting here means to be divided in one's mind or to debate in one's mind. And this term also describes a divided allegiance or an uncertainty. If we allow doubt to creep in and cause us to doubt if God can work in a certain situation, we are essentially tying God's hands to work in us and through us and tying his hands to help us. And the term double-minded here means two souls. In other words, if one part of a person is set on God and the other part is set on this world, there will be constant conflict in between and within us. And God can only fully work in us and through us if we are completely surrendered to God and believe wholeheartedly in Him. Amen? Verse 9 through 11 says, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers with the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Here, James is offering two examples of trials. One is of the lowly brother, and the other is the rich man. Lowly means poor in contrast to the other man who is rich, of course. The poor believer is to glory, or what does glory mean? Count it all joy in the fact that God has exalted him by allowing him to experience difficult circumstances. You know, God doesn't necessarily, he doesn't cause our hardships, but he may allow them to happen just so that we can have an opportunity to be built up in him. So the poor believer is to count it all joy in the fact that God has exalted him by allowing him to experience those difficult circumstances, for these will only perfect his character and his faith if he stays rooted and grounded in God. The rich believer, however, can also glory when a trial brings him low because it teaches him that life is short and that his pursuits, meaning his riches, his accomplishments, all of his earthly pleasures, will fade away. You know, a lot of people put stock into, um, and when I say put stock into, they put a lot of thought into, they cherish all their possessions. It's good to enjoy what you have on this earth. But the moment that you put your possessions and wealth above God, that's a problem. But the rich believer can glory when a trial brings him low because it will teach him that his life is short and his pursuits, his riches, his accomplishments, all his earthly pleasures will fade away. From his trials, the rich man must learn that he should always trust the Lord and never himself or his money. Because when we try to trust in ourselves and trust in the worldly things, then we're going to be let down because nothing in this world is perfect. Nothing in this world lasts forever. The only one who's perfect and lasts forever is God. Verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. In other words, the believer who endures trials demonstrates that he or she loves Jesus and therefore will receive the crown of life and the kingdom of heaven at the judgment seat of Christ. And the Bible describes the believer's reward under various vivid images such as precious metals, garments, and crowns. I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures that you can go back and reference because there were several, 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 um, and we don't have time to cover all of these scriptures, but I'm going to give them to you real quick. You can write them down and go back to them later. The description of the rewards that we receive, um, the vivid images are precious metals, garments, and crowns. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Again, that's 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. Next is Revelation 22 and 12. Revelation 22, 12. 1 Corinthians 3, 8 through 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 8 through 14. Revelation 3 and 5. Revelation 3.18, Revelation 19.7 and 8, 
1 Corinthians 9 and 25. Revelation 2, 10. And Revelation 3, 11. Those are some scripture references about the rewards and the, the medals, garments, and crowns that we would receive having... You know, when our soul passes away and we get to heaven, having accepted Jesus as Savior. So we move to verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. You know, the focus on this chapter at this point turns from trials to temptations. But they can sometimes go hand in hand. But our point in this verse is temptation to sin will never come from God. Temptation to give up will never come from God. God will never deliberately lead a person to commit sin because that would not only go against his nature, but it would be opposed to his purpose of molding his creation into his holy image. What is his creation? We are his creation. We are made in his image. Yet, God sometimes does allow his people to experience various circumstances for the purpose of building godly character. It's how we go through the trials, how we react to them and act in them that determines our outcome. Verses 14 and 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So drawn away and enticed express the intensity with which desire lures an individual until we are tragically entrapped by sin. Sin does not force itself on the unwilling, but it disguises itself in such a way that it lures us if we allow it. That It entices itself in such a way that it makes it hard for somebody to resist. But the key to a healthy, strong relationship with God and a healthy, strong, prosperous, joyful life is to resist the temptation to sin. Amen. The phrase, when desire has conceived, suggests the image of a person's will bending toward and finally seizing evil. This same idea is vividly illustrated by the tragic path of an addict. A habit once acquired completely controls that person eventually. And you know, addict doesn't necessarily have to mean um, drugs, alcohol, um, gambling addiction, or things like that. You know, although that's what it's more frequently known as and associated with when you hear the term addict. You can be addicted to food, and all you think about is food. You can be addicted to television. You can be addicted to TikTok or social media. You can be addicted to pornography or anything. Anything, if spent... If, if allowed to overtake us in our time in life, anything can become an addiction. So we must be careful. And the term full grown suggests bringing a goal to completion. The idea here is that sin has reached its full maturity and has possessed the very character of the individual. So again, we must be careful to not be tempted and drawn away from God by the desires of this world and by our own fleshly desires. Because if we allow it to do so long enough, then it traps us. And when it becomes full grown, it possesses our time and it just becomes 
it just takes over us. And of course, when it says that sin brings forth death, it is talking about spiritual death because we die in our relationship with Jesus. And it also talks about physical death because we will all pass away from this world one day. But if we die in sin, we commit ourselves to an eternity in torment in hell. So no matter what, we must never give in to temptation or trials, no matter how enticing it may be at that time. And you do have a choice. Some people say, well, you know, I couldn't help it. You know, I was I was made to do this, or I was, I was enticed to do this, or, you know, so-and-so made me do it. I just felt like this in the moment. You have a choice. Verses 16 through 18. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. What I want us to focus here uh, in these couple of verses are the two phrases to describe God's giving. The first gift, where it says every good gift, the first gift means the act of giving and is accompanied by the adjective good. The second gift denotes the actual gifts received from God and how it is described by the adjective perfect because everything of God is perfect. The first expression, again, emphasizes the goodness of receiving something from God, and the second emphasizes the perfect quality of whatever God gives. God's giving is continuously good, and his gifts are always perfect. Verses 19 and 20. And after we discuss these two verses, we'll close. But verses 19 and 20, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The conclusion of this introduction of James is, the, is that enduring trials leads to a crown of life in heaven, and that yielding to temptation can lead to spiritual and physical death. Since that's the case, the believer, meaning us, in the midst of our trials, we need to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath or anger. In other words, we need to control our tongue. The tongue sometimes is a hard thing to control because our flesh wells up within us and the devil speaks into our minds and makes us think that those are our thoughts. And when we get in a pressured moment, when we feel our emotions rising up in us, when we feel anger rising up within us, is at that moment we need to learn to control this thing that we call the tongue and do not say anything harsh or rash and do not give into our emotions and become angry. And if we do become angry, we need not sin. If we get angry in difficult circumstances and do something wrong, then the practical righteousness of God will not be evident in our lives at that moment. If we get angry towards a person in a difficult moment, then that person that we're angry against that experiences our anger will not see God in us at that particular time. And that moment is what's going to stick out to them more than any other moment that they spend with us. That's what they are going to remember most about us. So when someone wrongs us, the natural reaction is to retaliate, at least verbally. But this response does not glorify God. And that's something that each one of us needs to work on because we're all made of flesh. We're all tempted by the devil in hardships. But holding one's tongue, trying to understand the other person's position, and leaving the vindication or the revenge to God demonstrates godly love in tense situations. It's what some people on the earth would call being the better man. You know, letting it roll off your back. Don't say a word because, you know, if you're going to say a word, it's going to harm you and it's going to harm that person. So, as a short recap as we close, we're all going to go through trials. 
each and every day. Some of them are minute and small. Some of them are the biggest trials we'll ever face. But we shall not, shall not give up in the midst of trials. And we should not give in to anger or temptation in the midst of our trials. Instead, we must make the conscious effort to stop, listen, and pray to God for guidance through every trial and temptation so that we can hear his voice and follow in the path that he has for us. In turn, growing our relationship with God, growing in our patience and in our endurance, and also showing others lost in sin around us that we have the power through God alone to push through our trials and come out better than before. So hold on, even in the midst of your trials. And I know that a trial can be overwhelming. Believe me, we all know that. But do not lose sight of God, church. Hold on to God as tightly as you can and never let go. And in those moments that we are tempted to lash out in anger or speak something harsh, suppress that. Hold that tongue. Do not speak something that you would regret because you don't want to burn a bridge between you and somebody That because God may want to use you later on in that person's life. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, we bless your name, and we magnify you, Lord. We thank you for this time together, Lord God, just to glean in your word and to understand your word better. Lord, thank you for reminding us, God, that even though we each face some kind of trial or some kind of temptation every day, that you're always there with us. Thank you for reminding us, God, that we don't need to give in to our fleshly nature, our temptation to lash out in our emotions, Lord God, that we don't need to give up in the midst of our trials just because it gets a little hard, you know, because you are always with us. You never leave us and you never forsake us, God. And you always make a way of escape through trial and temptation, Lord God. And that way of escape is you, Father God and Lord Jesus. As long as we keep our eyes on you, keep our minds focused on you, and hold on tight to you and your presence, you will bring us through everything we go through, no matter how big or small. And when we do those things, God, and it does take effort on our part because our flesh just wants to react. But when we take the time to think, stop and think and hold on to you and ask and pray for your guidance and we cling to you, it shows those in the world around us just how strong you are in us, how, how evident you are in us, and how strong we can be in you, God. It shows them that there is a way to face life and trials and temptations other than just shouting profanities or waving hands angrily or then to act out rashly or in anger, Lord God, that would cause a uh, cause a relationship to be broken that would need to be mended, Lord God, that would burn a bridge between us and someone else. Just help us, God, to always stand strong in you through everything that we face, God. Be our comfort. Be our strength. Be our peace, Lord, and just help us to guard our minds against the thoughts the devil tries to place in our minds and help us to guard our mouths against what our flesh would say in times of har uh, hardship and temptation. Lord God, just help us to stand strong in you, that you can be evident in us to the world around us. 
And we ask it in Jesus' name, God. Just everything that we go through, draw us closer to you, Lord God. We ask all these things in Jesus' holy, mighty, and precious name. And the church says, Amen. Amen, guys. So this, like I said, it begins the start of our mini-series in James. Sister Brenda will be coming next Sunday night with the next part of our study in the book of James. Um, but don't forget, tomorrow night at 6 o'clock is our Monday night prayer meeting. And so make sure that you get those prayer requests to us online via Facebook, Faith Family Church of God Facebook page. Or if you're a member, you do the FFCOG family page as well. Um, message me, Sister Brenda, Pastor, um, any of Sister Marsha's groups as usual. Get those requests to us. And if you have a praise report and want to share that as well, please feel free to share that with us. And we will glorify God with you in that time. Monday night, tomorrow night, 6 o'clock for prayer. And then Tuesday night, 6.30, Sister Linda Lott will be bringing the word for our youth our Regen FFCOG Youth, Tuesday night, 6.30. And Pastor, on Wednesday night, Pastor will be bringing the Bible study at 6.30 online as well. All are encouraged to attend and watch and comment. All people, all ages, no matter where you are, who you are. We love you. We bless you. In Jesus' name. See you all tomorrow night. Be blessed.